Hi, I'm John Atak, and this is my good friend Joe Zimha. And um, we, we've been talking behind the scenes where nobody can see us uh, about Joseph Campbell and the hero myth. And um, I guess because we've both been deeply interested in religious ideas and, and the mythologies of the past, we've both encountered Campbell's work along the way. I think for both of it, it it's a while ago. It, I haven't read a Campbell book for about 20 years, but um, I was deeply impressed with him. Um, and I read The Masks of God, which is his four or five hundred page books and um, half a dozen of his other books. Um, you know, as, as a as a way of understanding better um, religion in general. I mean, I also read uh, Mochia Eliada at the same time, who's another major source. Um, both of them have ideas that have since been questioned. Um, but um, why don't you kick us off with, um, you know, the significance of, of Campbell to, to the last generation, um, particularly you know, things like the movies, for example. Right. Uh, the, um, you know, w when I left the, the, the main group I was in, which was Church Universal and Triumph, and I began a search like a lot of people do to get to the bottom of what this was about and and why I got caught up in it and I I backed into or or found a lot of rich information in the world of uh, uh, anthropology and, and uh, research into mythologies yeah. uh, so I, in a sense I was participating in a kind of a myth of the ascended masters that came out of um, Madame Blavatsky and the early Rosicrucians, and then was expanded by the I Am activity and, and many other groups that, that are out there. There's, there's dozens and dozens of them, mm -hmm. as I found out. Um, to some degree, the Freemasons uh, participate in this myth mm -hmm. uh, that somehow you can tap into a kind of a secret ancient ethics and knowledge and um, and that that is what really runs the world, this perennial wisdom that comes from ancient cultures. Uh, Pythagoras tapped into it, for instance, according to them. The ancient Egyptians did. Uh, the Greeks, to some extent. Um, one of the consistent themes that I found through, through that angle on history was a, a, a consistent attack on mainstream Christianity, and the so-called Abrahamic religions. Yep. The idea that there is this one God and that he has been revealed through a prophet like Moses or um, Muhammad, or in a sense uh, physically embodied by a prophet like Jesus. <laughs> you know, So um, the, the mythologists look at that as another type of myth. Yeah. that became the dominant cultural myth in the West. And, and of course, we all know that it's, whatever that myth is, it's not really dominant because there's probably 5,000 versions of the Christian myth out there. And you could go to you know, any number of churches and sects and denominations and find different spins on Jesus. Right. You know, I mean, William all, Blake said, yeah. It's also said Let that- Let me just finish this one thing. Yeah, uh, I, I recall doing an honors course on Williams Blake, the William Blake back in, um, 1969 in college and I remember him saying something like um, in one of his poetic things uh, you know uh, thy Jesus has a hook nose like thine and my Jesus has a snub nose like mine you know so he was sort of and he was kind of a Gnostic in his own way and he came up with his own system that he said of, of uh, reflecting mm -hmm. reality and myth and and the inner psychology of man. He was one of the first poetic psychologists in a way. Mm, absolutely. So, I, I was just going to make an aside about, you talk about there being 5,000 forms of Christianity. I just wanted to point out that if you have two rabbis in a room, you'll have at least three opinions. That, <laughs> you know, that, that And the same is true with you know the Sunniyat and the, the, the Shiat Ali. That, and within the Shia, you have the Twelvers and the Seveners. Um, you have the followers of the Aga Khan. There are all sorts of, and of course, in, in Sunni Muslim, we have Wahhabis, Salafis, yeah. who make up a very small percentage, but also created uh, Al-Qaeda. 
So yeah. there are all sorts of things going on. And William Blake, that there's a specific piece that he wrote. He's known in this country for having written the poem Jerusalem, uh, yeah. which is the most popular church hymn in this country. Yeah. And I think most people who are singing it would be surprised to find that he did not consider himself a Christian, that he considered yeah. himself a follower of Christ, but he believed that Jehovah was actually the bad influence in the universe. And there's a little piece written in the 1790s where he explains this, you know, this, uh, this interesting idea, which is a kind of almost Manichean idea, the idea of um, good and evil, but, but he sees Jehovah as being evil rather than mm -hmm. you're getting into the RMI. Yeah, you know. yeah, yeah, it gets kind of convoluted, but, but Blake uh, uh, actually in, in, a, in a poem called that Jehovah or the creator God, uh, he named him Nobo Daddy. Nobo Daddy, yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah. So, so he, he kind of falls into the Gnostic realm of, of Christianity, and he, he borrowed a lot from Swedenborg, Emanuel Swedenborg, of course, and, and Blake was a Swedenborgian when he was young, but then he veered off into his own world, which, uh, we know. perhaps We perhaps, I mean, we've already got into such complexity without even starting. We perhaps better <laughs> explain to, to uh, uh, the, the our poor viewers what, what we mean by Gnostic. Um, yeah. Gnosticism is, is a movement that um, came into Christianity but pre-existed. It, it's used by some sociologists. They talk about neo-Gnosticism. And the idea is that uh, reality is revealed to you through a set, set of initiations um, and you become one of the elect. That's where we get the word from, electoi in Greek, I think. And these date back to the Eleusinian mysteries, which are at least... Yeah go back to 1200 BC. And in these groups, you would basically go through a series of uh, well, initiations. The ultimate one seems to have been where you would have been led through complete darkness, blindfolded and placed in a coffin. Uh, the lid would be put on and you would be left there for a certain time. And you, as when you came out of the coffin, you would be reborn. And so this mm -hmm. was a very physical form of resurrection, which is a one of the myths that Campbell found exists all over the world and in every yeah. religion. It gave birth to groups such as the Rosicrucians, who seem to have been significantly influenced by a man called Cagliostro, if I've read my history right, yeah. who was a, a fraudster and con man who spent the last years of his life with him and his um, companion, Serafina, both in prison and both telling ever larger stories about all of the tricks that they pulled on the crowned heads of Europe. Out of that related to it come the Freemasons um, who pretend that they are an aspect of the Guild Masons of the Gothic period and that, that they're tacked onto that. But they actually seem- Yeah, okay, John. <laughs> You're really going off. <laughs> but I think- I mean, the, this is esoteric territory and if you're not familiar with it, it can be very difficult to, to grasp. It's because you, know, you mentioned so, these groups and it's to say that they're all yeah. Gnostic groups. They're all groups that have initiations, levels, degrees that you're meant to progress through. And at each level you've ach achieved, you know, a new wisdom. We see it very much in the modern, um, the dangerous cult groups like Scientology, which is of course mm -hmm. a progression of levels that you go through, which while they pretend to be you know, you go through a certain degree of counselling and you're meant to achieve something at the end of each level. Uh, palpably, they do not. So, for example, mm -hmm. the communication release in Scientology, one of the very low levels, you're meant to have achieved the ability to communicate with anyone on any subject. And uh, they're not allowed to talk to me. So that didn't work for most of them. You know, there are prohibitions around it. But these movements, I think they're incredibly important because most... Uh, conspiracy theories seem to go back to the Illuminati at some point, yeah. which is one of these Gnostic groups and their secret societies. They have different influences on, on the world. Um, yeah, well, the, the um, you know, this the sort of idea, the Gnostic idea, and there were dozens of different variations on Gnosticism. Mm. So they weren't one of a type. Their, their main theme, from what I could gather, is that this world is kind of a fallen place with with fallen rules and 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 it's it's ephemeral and the permanent 
place, what they call the pleroma or the great light, uh, was achievable only by those that knew mm. what it was in, in, in a very deep soul sense. And uh, not everybody had the power to know. Mm. Uh, they, you know, the Gnostics tended to divide society up into three categories, the, the pneumatics, those who know, the psychics, those who can know, and, and the hylix, the mud people, those who can never know. And guess what? Most of the people that have ever been born on earth are hylix. They're the ignorant, according to that scheme. So you can understand why a lot of modern cults adopt that to some degree without even knowing where it came from, that only the special, the elite, the, the knowing ones will recognize the, the teacher. For instance, uh, that, that saying, you know, the, the Buddha will appear when the student is ready. And, and guess what? The, the seeker always thinks he's enlightened enough to be ready. And guess what? The Buddha appears and he appears in the guise of Charlie Manson and Jim Jones and L. Ron Hubbard. And, you know, you, you can go on with this. Yes. And, uh, but, but the saying is very powerful because it's, it's self uh, esteem raising that somehow you've read a couple books, you've had a couple of powerful psychedelic experiences, you seem to know something about the nature of the universe and you need a teacher. And suddenly there he appears or there she appears. I mean, I had so. exactly this conversation with Joe Kelly last week in uh -huh. seeing him and he was saying you know, he was with Transcendental Meditation um, for I think nine years. And then yeah. Swami moved in. When he sat down with the Swami, he saw a golden light. You know. So he, and he quoted that thing to me, you know, when, when the pupil is ready, the guru will arrive. Right. And um, the point is that there's a guru quite ready to arrive somewhere in your town right now. Uh, sure. And it, it's so much, much fun. Just to bring Joseph Campbell back into this, because uh, one of the, the, the things I saw of, of Campbell's journey of the hero, it, it goes in 12 stages. Hmm. And I'll just recite them quickly here because I, I looked at this yesterday. There's the ordinary world that we all kind of get born into and live in and whatever religion we're in. Then there's the call to adventure, the kind of the Jonathan Livingston Seagull thing where you're going to break away from the crowd, right? You know, you're going to suddenly get a brilliant idea that you're different, that you're special, that you're not like these other people. So there's the call to adventure. The third is the refusal of the call. So in other words, you begin a little skeptical. You wonder, is, is, am I going to make it? Is this going to kill me? You know, are there going to be dragons? <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. And then, then the fourth stage is the meeting of the mentor. And that's where you find the, the, the shaman, the, uh, the, the, the master, the, 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 the Zen person that's already been there, you know, the guru on the mountain, all of that stuff. And that's that same point we just brought up. When the student is ready, the guru will appear. The fifth one is called crossing the threshold. And that's an initiation where you finally make a commitment to really going for it, whatever this thing is, you know, this adventure. The, the sixth one is to test uh, allies and enemies. So now you begin to figure out who's in and who's out, who's for you and who's against you. Okay. And then... The seventh stage is to approach the, uh, the inmost cave. In other words, now you're getting into the real secrets of the whole thing. And, you, and, and, and this is more dangerous because caves mean darkness and you need to supply your own light and, and, and all of this risky stuff. And there could be a bear back there, you know, that kind mm, of thing. There probably is. There probably there is. Probably is. <laughs> and then the eighth stage is the ordeal. The hero goes through the ordeal, meaning that... Um, and this ordeal is means you're hundred percent in, you do it till death. It's kind of like in the movie Glory, where the black culture, the, where, where a soldiers all on their own, and it's a true story, where they have their final assault on a, on a, on a, a, a southern, uh, during the Civil War, a, a bastion. And they know they're going to die because they're outnumbered, but they, they run into Glory. And, and, and you can see in the film, they're just dying left and right. All the heroes are dying, you know? So, so that's the ordeal for the hero. Yeah. Um, but he also thinking he might survive, you know? So the reward is that he gets through it, that he somehow gains great power by, by challenging the dragon and he wins. And then there's the road back. Now, how do you come back with all this knowledge and wisdom from, from your victory? Yeah. 
um, when the road back is through resurrection. Yeah. Okay, that's the 10th, the 11th phase is, is resurrection. And, you know, when you think about this idea of being in a coffin, like you mentioned, some Gnostics groups might have used or the illusion mysteries that, that they borrowed from. That even happens today in the Skull and Bone Society at Yale University. George W. Bush talked about that. That was one of the secrets that he couldn't reveal. But of course, it's, you know, all the all those cats are out of the bag these days when it comes to secret societies. Actually, and then the final the, the final stage that I'll quit here is this return of the elixir. In other words, that thing which gives you the fountain of youth, which gives you enlightenment, which w whatever it is, the hero can now share it. You know, and, and for instance, you have somebody like George Gurdjieff claiming that he had some kind of a thing called the enabling substance. That's what he called it, the elixir. So he was the hero that went to the secret area, went to the cave, came back, and now he's the teacher. Now he's the one that can reveal this to, to his followers and devotees. And of course, Gurji failed because he was one of those who didn't have the elixir in, in the long run anyway, but, but people that, that followed him thought he did. So, okay, I'll stop there. That, that's the rundown on Campbell, on his mm. hero journey. Yeah, and I mean, he was determined to show that, that Jung's collective unconscious was out there by researching mythologies from everywhere in the world that he could in the late 40s, um, pr produced his uh, hero with a thousand faces to explain yeah. this. And he, he kept on going until he, he gradually was able to deconstruct the idea that this sprang out of the human mind wherever it was by showing that there had been cultural transmission, um, even you know from Japan to South America. Um, we know about the Vikings going to, to North America, but we can basically show that for the most part, these stories came through the Middle East um, mm -hmm. and the religions of Egypt, India and China all seem to be derivative of, of something that happened in Sumeria and then was exported through Babylon. And the, the same ideas present, he you know, then he looks at it in terms of the Arthurian legends and particularly the story of Parseval and the Fisher King within that story who has the, um, the Holy Grail and he's been wounded and it is through his wound that he will teach others. This is also completely bound up with the ideas of alchemy, which yeah. in turn, a footnote that, that is complicated, that there is at the beginning of the Renaissance, there is the cult of Hermes Trismegistus. And yeah. it would seem that this is, this is a kickstart for all of the later, you know, the Rosicrucian movements, what have you. And it's worth pointing out that it was fraudulent, as far as we can tell. They, they claimed to go back to Egypt, as all of these groups do. Um, it claimed, you know, the Temple of Solomon as one of its origins, right. um, with the pillars of Joachim and Boaz, which the Freemasons to this day. Yes. Yeah. And it, what seems to happen is that a story will be generated to, to justify a grand history. One of the things that, that Campbell points out is a wonderful book called The Flight of the Wild Gander, which is the most obscure of his books and one of his favorites. And he, he talks there about the dissemination of folklore. So a good example is the story of the guy who loses his keys and is found underneath the street lamp looking for, for them. And somebody says to him, oh, you lost them here. And he says, no, but there's no light where I lost them. Now, that story has been told in Russian films. I've read it in at least three psychology textbooks, but it actually comes from the Mullah Nasruddin. It's a, an old thousand year old um, Muslim story. Okay. It's such a useful story that it, what was shown by the Finnish Folklore Society, I think, um, who've been studying this stuff since the beginning of the 19th century, was that within one generation, any story is incorporated into the folklore. So they would find, you know, the Grimm brothers would be going around Germany and they'd be told a story that the Müller Nasruddin had written down 700 years before that had actually only been told to the father of the storyteller, you know, that, and this cultural transmission 
becomes very significant because groups like the Masons will pick up a history as they go along. They'll just they'll say, oh, Leonardo da Vinci and Dan Brown were both members of our group. You know, they'll they'll be that the same culprits will seem to have belonged to every secret society that ever existed. Um, the other part of that is that Campbell does seem to have a point that we can look at life in this way. And he says, everybody travels the hero journey. Being born is a heroic act. Yeah. And if you survive it, then you started. But I'm not sure how useful the story, I'm not sure that it, it really is a coverall story. I think it- uh, No, I, I think, yeah, I think that too. Uh, but one thing in Campbell's favor, you know, despite his romanticism, because he was a romantic in a sense, and, and he, he um, the main criticism of his is, is that he never really did any on-site research into myth. Like for instance, uh, an anthropologist I knew who was a, a Hickory Apache, a, a woman, uh, she criticized Campbell in the sense that, that she, he kind of misrepresents her cultural myths in order to fit his own scheme. Yeah. You know, so that, there's that criticism out there, but beyond that, he, he's brilliant in many ways, Campbell. Yeah. But one thing I thought that was most brilliant about him is that he said that the hero doesn't always make it and that he can create a fiasco. Mm. So when you look at our modern cults, you see them trying to be heroic, being somebody's hero. And, and the, the, the members, the followers become the uh, therapeutic project for the hero. In other words, the hero is going to give them the elixir and help them to become enlightened. Mm. So they become a therapeutic project. And I'm, I'm borrowing that from Otto Rank. That, that was his idea of, of this collective having a, a someone that, that 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 will teach you and will train you and will save you, mm -hmm. you know, through their elixir of life, whatever that might be. Well, it could be their body and blood. Yeah. You know, the, the elixir could be the body and blood of the person, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. Sun Myung Moon took that very literally, didn't he? And uh, yes, he did. Um, his bodily fluids and the uh, uh, Osahara used to sell off his uh, used bath water, apparently. Yeah, and, and, and Saddam Hussein uh, had his blood drawn and had a complete Koran scripted out from his blood. Yes, he did. <laughs> That's fantastic, isn't it? Yeah. What a strange man he was. Well, he was a hero, he but, but, he created a, but he created a fiasco. Hmm. He didn't complete the journey. That's the idea behind Campbell. Yeah. yeah and caused catastrophe all around him. And I mean, when I left Scientology, my, you know, as I looked at things, because you know, I'd been involved with Buddhism before and uh, it was very a seeker. I was somebody who was looking for the darkest place in the forest to go in and get wounded and come out with something to tell people. And it kind of happened, uh, not really in the way I'd have wanted it to, <laughs> but it, it, you know, that I was very interested in, in this notion of seeking and the idea of the journey. And it, but it seemed to me that probably the vast majority of the people who set themselves up as authorities in this field are bogus. They're, mm -hmm. they're often, in fact, very shallow students. So uh, I was looking at uh, Maranan Sheila's fascinating book about her time with Rajneesh, um, because while Wild Country, the only, you know, I didn't like it because it was just the aristocracy of the group you didn't get to talk to the people who worked the 19 hour day and yeah. got no time with but but whatever they were very interesting people but nobody more so than Maran and Sheila who I think served eight years in prison for the atrocities committed by the Rajneeshis and here she is we find her at the end of the series she's running a a, a, a home for geriatric patients yeah. with dementia and you kind of go, this is not your typical sociopath. What's going on here? So I immediately went out and bought her book in which she says, I still love Rajneesh, even though he ordered me to do all of the things I did. And I think that she might well be telling the truth that she's actually an empath who was weaponized by Rajneesh. But in the book, she gives two um, quotations from two of his books and uh, quite you know, a page long. And I read these two things and I went, I recognize these stories. These stories are from Zen Flesh, Zen Bones by Paul Reps, which I read as a 17 year old. We, probably you did too. Lots of people read it. Great book. But he tells a story 
about uh, somebody becoming a Zen master because his master beats him with a stick every time, you know, he's not looking, the guy will come up and thwack him with a stick. I'm kind of going, no, it, he didn't become a Zen master, he became a sword master. And it was suddenly realizing that to be Rajneesh, all you had to do was have three or four books that you could, you know, you probably have an Idris Shah, you know, you could steal a few stories. You could take a, a load of Valium diazepam, which is what he did do, a couple of snorts of nitrous oxide a day. They say he, he spent two hours a day with the nitrous oxide. Um, and then just regurgitate these stories as best you remember them and assume the, the position of the guru and say, well, with a living master, everything works. With a dead master, nothing yes. works, as Rajni said. But he created pandemonium all around him. And the same is true for Gurdjieff, for Hubbard, for Sun Myung Moon. Well, well, Gurdjieff, Gurdjieff was a was a one of the primary influences on Rajneesh. Oh, he okay. read a lot of Gurdjieff, yeah. and, and he, in fact, he called uh, one of the one of the uh, uh, the, the dam or something around Rajneesh Puram in Oregon. He called it a Gurdjieff Dam or something like that. He named it after the Gurdjieff. Mm -hmm. So he had his uh, his Zen, his Gurdjieff, his Theosophy. He borrowed from Theosophy. Yeah. You know, and I can point out places in, in his one of his first books where he does that. Um, so he was quite a rascal. He enjoyed being a rascal. I think he felt he had to be one because that's the only way people would get awakened. Uh, Gurdjieff certainly was harsh uh, on his followers, you know, making them strip naked around swimming pools and, and talk about their private parts to each other. And, you know, crazy stuff like that he would and, do. And I think it can be it can be asserted that Kathleen... Uh, or Catherine Mansfield uh, lost her life as a consequence of following his regimen rather than dealing with her tuberculosis but his treatment you know speeded her death which is a terrible loss to literature she was a brilliant writer um, yeah, so what so what we have here is the hero going through his crazy ordeals of learning something and and someone like Rajneesh and Gurdjieff more or less did it in their living room couches and at exactly. coffee shops you know, they, they didn't really go out there. There was no Sarmoon Brotherhood that, that Gurdjieff went to visit mm -hmm. and gain his secrets from. And, and Rajni certainly wasn't initiated into anything. You know, he was he was a couch potato reading books, you know, basically. And now to his credit, he was a good orator. He won uh, 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 debating prizes when he was in college. So he had the gift of gab. Mm -hmm. You know, he could do that. And, and he certainly enjoyed the costume and, and the throne and, and all of that stuff that, that came along with his tricks of the trade. Mm -hmm. But he also practiced something which the Zen people brought in that infected Western seekers is something called crazy wisdom. Yeah. And the idea that the guru has a right to fool the disciple in order to have them become enlightened, to save them from the burning house is one of the stories of, of uh, Zen Buddhism that that you can tell lies to the people in the burning house to get them out of there yep. because they don't know it's burning. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and then when they get out, then they will thank you. And so in the sense, you see someone like Gurdjieff or, or Rajneesh or the false hero saying, you're, you know, I had to trick you to leave your parents because they're evil. They've trapped you into this strange world of Judaism and Christianity that you were raised in. I'm going to free you from that, you know. So yeah, what I said was a lie, but look at what you're getting. Mm. You know that that that's the the, the bait and switch. And I, I mean, as a as a doctrine of itself, my background I, as a teenager, I was briefly involved with Zen Buddhism. I spent a couple of days in a monastery in the north of England, which was nowhere near as romantic as it should have been, and then had cold water. Um, but it, it led me ultimately to, because Zen was, it, it's, there's such a high regard for it. But what is thought of as Zen in the West has very little resemblance to the Zen Buddhist tradition. Um, so, for example, most people know about these, you know, what's the sound of one hand clapping, the koans as they're called. And you won't find them in most of Zen. They're only in, in the Rinzai in a occasionally the Obaku right. sects, the major sect, the Soto doesn't use them at all. So there are all sorts of stories. I, 
and and I, I think it's very worth saying that Daisat Suzuki, who was the channel through whom Zen Buddhism really erupted into the West when Alan Watts brought him over in the 1940s, that he was one of the people teaching soldier Zen. Mm. He was one of the people who has made the Japanese army the cruelest army in the world. Um, and so, the, you know, the crazy teaching, when we look at, you know, some Zen Buddhist enlightenment story, like the, the little boy who was a novice and the master would always, when people asked him a question, he'd hold up one finger one finger Zen, and that would be the master's answer to everything. And so he caught the little boy, who was, I think, 12 at the time, doing this in answer to questions, and he cut his finger off. And this immediately brought about enlightenment in the little boy. And, you know, what's it you know, worth? You gain the whole world, but you lose your little finger. Um, that there is a cruelty in Zen Buddhism. When I went to the Throstle Hole Priory, the first thing I was told was they didn't use the Zen stick. Mm. And I said, what Zen stick? And they said, oh, in a normal Japanese monastery, if you move at all when you're meditating, they thwack you across the shoulders with the stick. So um, Arthur Kersler, because his friend Aldous Huxley had become involved in all of this, actually went to India and to Japan and wrote a book called The Lotus and the Robot. I don't have a tremendously high opinion of Arthur Kersler as a human being but it's a very good book because it basically says what we get is the couch potato version. It is yeah. the library version, the video version. When you look, for example, to India, he found that I think 98% of all charity in India came from Christian organizations because the idea of karma vipaka, that you get what you deserve, yeah. means that charity is not a normal aspect of Hinduism. And no, it's not. It, you know, and, and it wasn't really in in theosophy either. They adopted that idea that that you deserve your karma. Now, now a group like Ramtha, Jay Z Knight's Ramtha, took that to an extreme, and and you could hear her disciples or so called students in the eighties reciting this, saying that that you know that you, you don't have to put a, a murderer in jail because one maybe the, the, the victim needed to be killed because of their karma, and that if the murderer did anything wrong, then they would have aeons and aeons of suffering, you know, based on their own wrong. So, so in other words, the law of karma after death and, and whatever the hell else is going on there in their, in their puny minds <laughs> uh, is going to take care of it. So, you know, the hell with the jails, you mm -hmm. know, so that was part of the uh, reasoning and, and in a sense, it forgives everything manipulative and stupid and dangerous that the leader would do. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, I, for instance, you know, let me give one example. Uh, several of my uh, uh, clients that were in Ramtha participated in, in one of these, these uh, things where a thousand of them were lined up 500 across from each other along a fence in, in a corral, a horse corral. They were blindfolded. And they were doing this, what's called CNE, consciousness and energy, and breathing like this. And then on the command of Ramtha, they had to charge one another like in something out of Braveheart. And these people were bouncing off each other. There were people that were sent to ERs. There were people with big bruises on their head, broken limbs, you know, uh, uh, scared old ladies that were afraid to move from the fence because th this was way beyond their ability to comprehend. Uh, but this kind of mayhem took place in this group as an initiation into overcoming fear. Mm. So, you know, you put that in your guru bowl and mix it and see what you come up with. But, but uh, I had a friend yeah. in Scientology. She'd been a very senior executive. And um, she came to me one day and she said, um, you know, by this time, she claimed not to believe in any of it. But she came to me one day and said, John, why are you wasting your talents? helping Scientologists, they've pulled it in, you know? And so I looked at her and said, if a four-year-old is going in front of a bus, do you just stand there? You know, it, let their karma fulfill itself. Mm -hmm. At the worst end, exactly what you just described is the doctrine of power. And this was adopted by uh, Osahara Forum Shinrikyo, yeah. And they decided that the best thing to do was to kill all of the Japanese people so they'd have a nice rebirth because you yeah. would extinguish their karma. And 
that that's how crazy it gets. I mean, karma is a whole other subject. The mathematics of karma is such an impossibility. You know, the lords of well, well, the, the Western version of the, you know, again, we 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 have absorbed a version of karma which is unlike what it was originally meant. Karma, uh, you know, as you know, translates as action. Yeah, and, and the I, idea, I, I have a book about it, you know, about the origins of karma. And, and essentially it was set up to regarding rituals because the ancient cultures in, in India were into rituals. For instance, Agni Hocha, where you, where you address the sun in the morning yeah. as it rises. Well, the idea of ritual is to do it precisely as required in, in the text. Mm. Otherwise, you create karma. You don't do the action properly. So, so the idea, it, it was really more for the priest to do it precisely as it's laid down so that you don't mess up the, the sacred order of, of being. You know, that was the idea behind it. So it's more of a metaphor than anything. But obviously think, the sun's going to rise, rise anyway, whether you screw up the Agni Hotra ceremony or not. But, but to just to participate in the metaphor somehow made you a more precise and better person. That was the idea behind it. Mm. But, but it wasn't generalized into all human behavior that if you messed up your dharma, you married the wrong person and you said something wrong that day and you didn't, you didn't uh, wear the right clothing and you, you didn't... Uh, um, uh, address the leader properly. You know th that wasn't part of the original idea of karma. That that has been a Western stretch. I don't think it is a Western stretch. I think it's an no. Eastern stretch. Um, and I would look back to the Digha Nikaya, the Buddhist sutras, where there is much discussion mm -hmm. of karma, and none of it is about the performance of rituals. Um, mm -hmm. Before that, uh, in the Vedic literature, I, I would look to um, the Akashic records and what he said about the Akashic records. So while it may have originated and we, we are speculating to some extent because it originated in prehistory. So, yeah. um, but we can go back long before Buddhism and Hinduism came to the West, ideas of Kama Vipaka develop, which are to be found in modern India now, uh, which are to be found in modern Japan now as well, where, mm. The idea is that the lords of Akasha are, which are not a Western invention, are keeping a record of every living being and making sure that it all fits together. So while I agree with you, that it probably is about the precision of ritual. I know in, in Rome, for example, the Emperor Claudius, that up until his time, if any priest made an error in the three days of uh, preceding the games, they had to start again. And Claudius was the first emperor to say, no, you know, just get on with it. So that idea of placating the gods and communicating exactly with the gods, you, you're probably right, it underlies this, but it's not Western culture. It, it came to us from the East. Um, okay, I, yeah, I, I think I, I, I agree with you there, but, but this predates Buddha by probably one or 2,000 years. What the uh, book I'm, I'm separating at, the, in terms of where it might have come from. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But again, the literature there, as we get into the Vedic literature, its date and the, the certainty of what it means, it, it becomes a, the point is that, that those ideas had developed. So in Buddhism, th there is a difference in, in that it is uh, what, what, you, what you think you shall become, which is actually said in the Bhagavad Gita as well, but you, you, you are the product of your own thoughts. And so if you are um, unethical in your approach to the world, then those you will run into calamity. The, the problem is how on earth the computer of the universe would be working out how to put those 417 people on that plane on that day when it crashed, which is the point where karma can be seen as a, as a moral responsibility that you take on rather than something that controls the reactions of, of the whole universe. Um, which tends to be the cultic view of it. That um, so, I mean, in in Scientology, a friend of mine complained that his girlfriend was driving too fast, and and she said, um, to use the Scientology term, "You're not PTS, are you?" You know. That, so basically, the idea is, if if you are in a perfect state, then nothing can harm you. And so she was willing to drive like a maniac because she believed that she was ethically pure. 
and that's mm -hmm. another extension of this of, of this that develops out of the idea of right action, uh, of right karma. Yeah, I, I think it boils down to the formula that enlightenment equals entitlement, yes. which always gets you in trouble. You know, it, it's a misspelling of enlightenment, but uh, but basically that's what I find going on in, in, in all of these uh, fiascos, as Campbell would call them, that the hero feels enlightened and therefore he's entitled to do this crap that, that he does. brings you know? us back to the Gnostic sects as they emerge through Christianity, where you had this notion of the electoi, and these people would be served by the people around them, and they were considered to be halfway into the next world. In among many of the Christian Gnostic sects, this was because they believed they had the passwords to get through the planets to take them to heaven after they died, and that was the yeah. secret knowledge they had. Um, that was kind of like the the Bardo, the the, the Book of the Dead yeah. idea. Yes. Yeah. Well, the implant stations of Scientology, which I'm told are still there. <laughs> um, didn't manage to do anything about them. You know what? You bring up an interesting point. Um, uh, that just reminded me, among the Caesars, whenever they were brought in to power, um, and also among the popes, there's this, this something that goes on here, which most people don't know. When the Caesar was per being paraded down the streets of Rome to announce his glory, there was always a slave boy, a servant, that, and behind him, repeating continually, remember thou art mortal, remember thou art mortal. You know, so, and the same thing happens when a Pope is initiated, there's an acolyte that says something very similar. You know, it, it, it translates like that, remember thou art mortal. This is just a title, mm -hmm. you know? So somewhere, at least in those traditions that we see as very powerful, the Holy Roman Empire and the Popes and all that, there are these, reminders to get humble don't take this too seriously you know you can get carried away all of that is embedded in the culture you know but most people miss that when they look at the caesars or look at you know the popes they tend well, to look at generalities yeah but you can certainly say that tiberius caligula and nero to name a few took no notice whatsoever of that attendant no but, they didn't listen to the servant boy no not at no, all nor did and, the uh, six famous popes of, of the renaissance right. you know who uh, performed some remarkably strange activities um the the idea that you know the borgia pope uh, alessandro borgia sat sat with his daughter, the famous poisoner, Lucretia Borgia. The fact that he had a daughter is, for some people, a little odd with a priest, but let's not go there. As prostitutes picked up chestnuts with their private parts in the, uh, the Sistine Chapel, I believe it was. You know, so their, their notion, you know, then that little boy who was standing behind Alessandro, Pope Alexander, he wasn't listening to him at all. That, mm -hmm. but, but yes, that, and it, it is an it, it's an important aspect. Um, Caligula, of course, decided that he was in fact Zeus, so uh, didn't need to be warned of any such thing. <laughs> oh. Well, you know, grandiosity knows no bounds. <laughs> What's interesting too about the uh, the journey of the hero in, in, in Campbell is that in the end, when the hero comes back with the so-called elixir or the the salvation story um the, the world becomes ordinary again but it's changed to, to in, in the hero for the hero so uh the the idea there is is kind of like that old zen saying you know if you're first, first carrying a... water and, and and chopping wood what do you do after you're enlightened well you carry water and you chop wood yeah. you know so in other words the, the ordinary world becomes the ordinary world again and, and you are not so special. Now you might have something good to give, but it doesn't make you extraordinary. The fact that you're enlightened, that's part of the lesson in that that's lost uh, too often, I think. And, and the, the reality is that when we look to these enlightened beings and I've spent a lifetime looking for them because um, you know, from the age of 17 till the age of about 50, so, right through Scientology and beyond, I still believed in some state of enlightenment. And eventually it collapsed underneath me. And I sort of went, well, it's a silly idea, that this idea, because what I was looking for was 
complete emotional equanimity. I was looking for a serene state from which I could address the world. And um, I haven't met anybody that's actually achieved that state. And I've met a lot of people. I've met quite a few people who pretended it. Um, but uh, the Buddha talks about what he calls pratikayas, who are, he says, there have been Buddhas before me, but they did not teach, and mm -hmm. that most won't. And it's only you know, that Mara pleads with him to stay and teach after he achieves enlightenment, that he stays in, in the world for 40 years and, and carries on teaching. Um, even then, looking at the Buddha's teaching in some detail, there are aspects of it which are dangerous to humanity. And the essential one is the idea of celibacy. Mm -hmm. And one can understand there's the idea of escaping from desire and all of that, but there's a significant problem, which is if you take out the um, empathetic people and the intelligent people from a culture and they do not breed, they do not parent children, then you will start to get a, a society will degrade. You won't actually be promoting the best. It's why there were two uh, attempts in China to extirpate Buddhism, to, to get rid of it, because of course the Chinese Confucian system is absolutely based upon the family. So saying you're not going to have a family, it's a pretty dangerous idea. And uh, for whatever good Buddhism has done to the world, and I think it's done a great deal of good. I, I think that fundamental idea, and of course, for the Buddha himself, his son is born, he calls him hindrance and abandons him. So that's the Buddhist notion of, of parenting. He would later become a, a bhikkhu himself, a devotee himself. But mm. I think there's a difficulty there in the perception of the world. Um, and it leads to consequences, um, which may well have something to do with the collapse of Buddhist cultures around the world and the way that you know, Buddhism shrank after a certain period, after having a tremendous influence under Ashoka and a few yeah. beyond him. I think the Brahmins were powerful enough and smart enough to, to take their power back in India um, because they were the ones that the, under Ashoka and the Maurya uh, dynasties um, were misplaced by Buddhism for a while. But so there was a power struggle there, I think, and uh, they won out. And then the, yeah. then the Mughal came along and said, we're going to kill anybody that doesn't believe in God. Yeah. yeah. Buddhism <laughs> was gone from India, Sri Lanka. Yeah. And but, but what's also interesting about Buddhism, you know, in, in, its, in its pure origins, uh, as, you know, Buddha the hero, the way he taught, um, it has become more of, of a, an adaptive religion. It kind of um, it was an overlay over Confucianism, was an overlay over Shintoism. Was an, you know, like in Japan, they say you're born Shinto and you die Buddhist because you have a Buddhist funeral there. Shinto and, and doesn't have funerals. So, Tibetan um, Buddhism is, is fused with the Bonpo. Yes, same, same idea. So it's very much shamanic. It's very shamanic religion, uh, the... the the Tibetan version of it. And, yeah. and then of course the great vehicle, the Mahayana and the Hinayana have their own spins on, on, on things as well. And then you can argue that, that there are dozens of versions of Buddhism in the West now. You know, there's hybrids of, of, of Tibetan Buddhism, there's hybrids of Zen, there's hybrids of, of uh, maybe Chinese Buddhism mixed with Taoism, for instance. Absolutely, um, I mean, so, we're, we're having a problem here with the new Kadampa tradition uh, mm -hmm. My problem is firstly how you can have a new tradition, but let's not worry about that. And um, we are hearing of casualties. You know, I've, I've done a couple of talks uh, with a psychologist uh, who was involved, Michelle Haslam, who has two PhDs, but she still was pulled into this group. And the, it can have a profound effect. Now, they are actually outlawed by the Dalai Lama because they worship a demon yeah. and uh, it's like, but within the Bon religion, that's perfectly okay. So we get these complexities. I also think inevitably you see terrible uh, dilution. And I have spoken publicly 
to the effect that I do not believe that Mahayana is Buddhism because a mm -hmm. fundamental principle of Buddhism, which is that you must seek enlightenment as a man leaves a house burning down, that it is something you do for yourself, is contradicted. And the contradiction, of course, a thousand years after the Buddha, a monk travels back in time and hears a sutra that Ananda yeah. did not record, the Flower Garland Sutra, which is a beautiful piece of work, don't get me wrong, um, which is the doctrine of mutual arising. And so we then have the Bodhisattva's vow that I refuse enlightenment until right. even the grass and the trees are enlightened. So they'll keep being reborn. So the Bodhisattva of compassion of Alokiteshvara is now in his 14th turn as Dalai Lama. Um, mm -hmm. One questions this a little bit when one reads the biographies of the preceding Dalai Lamas, who seem to be nothing like each other and nothing like this man. Um, well, it's, it's again, it's myth imposed on reality and reality has a way of of being wild and bucking it off. You know, yeah. it's, it's not really uh, uh, it, it doesn't conform to myth normally. Yeah. And the, and the you know, in the same way, Christianity adapted itself so that, mm -hmm. in fact, um, I think it was December the, the 8th was the. Um, I can't remember that there were two saints celebrated on that day for centuries. And then it was realized that this was, in fact, uh, I think Jehoshaphat may have been one of them. One of them is actually the Buddha. And oh, okay. in the same way that, you know, when they met the Cornish, they imported the goddess Bridget and she became Saint Bridget. Yes. So you have these. I don't think a Christian from the first century would have recognized the fourth century Christians under Constantine. Yeah. I don't think every generation creates a new form. And yeah, you know, John, I, I grew up with the St. Christopher medals and statues as the great protector of, G of Jesus and, and people as a kid in the 50s and 60s. And then lo and behold, we find out that St. Christopher was just a legend that never lived and, and all of that. On the other You're hand, tell me Santa Claus doesn't exist. Let's not go there. No, I see him in the malls. He's real. Oh. You can touch him. <laughs> you can touch him. Uh, you know, as a kid, I grew up too, a Hungarian family. We didn't originally have a Santa Claus in my household here in the United States. The idea was that the Christ child brought the gifts. Mm. It wasn't Santa Claus. This is something that's different. It's Germanic. It's, it's American. It's English. It's not. Yep. It wasn't in the early Hungarian tradition. And, uh, you know, so the, the, there was a St. Nicholas Day. That Santa Claus comes from, but that was celebrated earlier in December, um, and he wasn't, you know, the, the 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 chimney guy that brought the gifts. That that's a 19th century myth that sort of developed out of who knows where, probably well, some form of shamanism. There's a bishop in Turkey in the fifth century who is meant to have made gifts of money, and mm -hmm. he is one of the sources of the story. Yeah, I think Saint Nicholas is the patron saint of thieves, and um, so okay. part of the idea is that. He's stealing his stuff all through the year and looking after these people. So on one day of the year and the the costume, the, the red costume that we have goes back. I, I looked at this the other day, actually, oddly, because I've been told it comes from a Coca-Cola advert in the 30s. And in the form that we have it, that's accurate. Yeah. It seems to originate somewhere around the uh, in America around the time of the Civil War. There are versions in Holland and Germany. They wear green. And they have little black imps who make the, the gifts for them. And so, yeah, that and something is kind of reified. It becomes, well, of course, he wears a red thing with all this very stuff. And he lives at the North Pole. And as I say, the, the best we can get to for an origin for that story is a fifth century Turkish bishop um, yeah. who, who was very generous, apparently. Yeah, I... Um... I have um, uh, written a long article many years ago that, that the, uh, the Santa Claus myth actually comes from the Amanita muscaria, the red and white mushroom, and a shamanic tradition of shamans bearing gifts in winter, coming to visit families, and their huts had holes on the top, a chimney, and, and the shaman would come down, which is a normal way to do that because he didn't want the cold air to come in, and would bear gifts. And, and, uh, and the other idea of the mushroom was where the reindeer come in is 
the reindeer cultures up there in northern Finland and, and Russia and, and knew that the reindeer, when they ate this Amanita muscaria and also the culture ate it, it would make them a little crazy and they would dance around. They would fly, the reindeer would fly after eating the mushroom. So somehow, according to that version, these stories got mixed in with things that you're talking about as well. And we came up with Santa Claus and the flying reindeer. And the it mushroom came from a shamanic reindeer culture. Yeah. yeah. Mushroom is red and white. I'm told that the Sami, the Sami people would actually drink the urine of the reindeers because the reindeers could filter out the liver poisons that are otherwise present in. That, that, that's very true. In other words, the, the, um, the mushroom was twice born. Yes. It was ingested. It. That's how they called it. It was ingested. You know, they noticed the reindeer ingested it. And if they captured the urine after they, you know, the reindeer ingested it, they would have the psychedelic effects or whatever. You just wonder about the, the first Sami who decided to have a quick draft of reindeer pee, but who knows? I don't know. But, uh, curiously, uh, John Allegro, who was uh, a great biblical scholar and um, one of the translators of Dead Sea Scrolls, um, and one of the people who wondered why the Catholic Church didn't want these things to be out there, and they held them back and held them back for about 20 years. He wrote four books, um, the first fragments of the Dead Sea Scrolls, very scholarly book, um, but uh, I think the last one is called... Um, something like the sacred cult and the mushroom. And he decided- I think it was the, sa the sacred mushroom and the cross. That's it, the sacred mushroom and the cross. And he decided yeah. that Jesus had actually been taking psychedelic mushrooms. And so these stories come round and round. Also stories about witches flying on blooms broomsticks seem to come yeah. from these travels that people uh, believe they undertake when they've, they've taken a, a very powerful and very dangerous substance such as Amanita muscaria. Yeah, of course the- you must the, get a rain broomstick. first if you want to use them. <laughs> of course the broomstick also functions as a phallic symbol and, and the ecstasy of, of orgasm, you know, riding a broomstick. So who knows where all that came from, you know, because that was considered forbidden to do that kind of thing in, in medieval culture. Yeah. Um, but, but yeah, so I don't know how we're doing for time here. Uh, uh, so how do you see uh, Campbell now in terms of um, his, his influence? Um, I mean, I know he's influential in literature, but in terms of religious ideas, I mean, do you have any ideas about that? Well, I think firstly, in, in terms of literature, he was incredibly influential. You know, Mad Max, Star Wars films. There was a point in Hollywood in the 1980s where because Lucas had said he relied upon these things, and I'm not personally sure how true that is. Um, for example, it said that the first draft of Star Wars doesn't mention the Force, that it was somebody who was one of the script editors while they were putting the movie together who said, oh, we can use that, which is a kind of, you know, we, we have uh, two or 300,000 people in this country who in the census form uh, say that they are Jedi, that that's their religion. Yeah. We only have about 2,000 Scientologists, but you know they've been up to 300,000 Jedi. And this, and what about the poor Sith? Nobody's saying they belong to the Sith. If they've been, and, and their story is all told by their enemies. It's just not fair. Count Dooku was a really nice bloke. I knew him. That this simplistic way of um, having, you know, the dark side and the light side of the Force is a misunderstanding of the Daichi or yin yang, as most people call it, where the forces are moving through each other, which is why there's a little black eye in the white one, a little white eye in the black one. So this simplistic view of good and evil, which again has a you know, karmic undertones, I think has had a tremendous effect on society. I think that mm -hmm. um, many people want to see the world you know, in, in black and white in that simple way. Um, Campbell's effect on, I mean, he was the president of the American Society for the Study of Religion or something okay. of that type. It seems to me that he was most certainly an agnostic, if not an atheist. Um, as the, the commentator you mentioned before said, he was not an anthropologist. He did study, he did go to India, he did sit in smoke lodges, and he did do these kind of things, but he was not a meditator. 
Um, he was not a practitioner of any system. Yeah, he was actually he was actually quite put off by the Indian culture. You know, he was much a university type. You know, that 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 liked order and 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 India as anything but orderly, even yeah. though it has this idea of dharma. Yeah. Yeah, and and he was said uh, as an individual to have a very bad temper. There's uh, a point where he got upset with somebody and jumped up and down on his hat. <laughs> yeah. um, which, you know, uh, and I do tend to view um, a bad temper as, as, a, as a bad thing, people who can't control their emotions. Um, but he wasn't making any claims about being a guru. And I think no. the pulling together of stories is fascinating. And his some of his fundamental ideas um, that you should follow your bliss. Now, he then gets kind of spooky on us by saying, and helping hands will come and help you along your way. Well, that's not my experience. And I, if he was alive, I'd sue him. You know, yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's a there's a, a book which uh, gave me a little more perspective on Campbell. And it came out in 1999. It's called The Politics of Myth by, by Elwood. And it's, it's worth a read. Right. But it looks at Jung, Eliot, and uh, Campbell. Oh, so, buy a copy of that. It looks fascinating. Yeah, it's it, it's it's a good read, I think. And uh, you know, it it places uh, Campbell and Jung and and Eliot in the Romantic tradition, in the idea of a pessimism of the modern world. You know? I, I mean, I I think it is true um, that every generation will reformulate the ideas, which Campbell himself said. But I think he points something out, which I think is very important, which is mythology is not history, it's psychology. Yes. And I think as that as a view is very useful because it means we can take any story and say, how is this useful to us? He says the fairy tales, the myths, the scriptures, whatever term we want to use for them, are useful to the extent that they teach us how to live yeah. and give us moral values. And I, I, and they need to be retold in every generation in different ways. No, and, and, and I think he's right. I, I yeah. think that, um, you know, every culture has to hand down its tradition somehow in order for there to be consistency in the family in the unit, in the village unit, whatever, in the religious unit. So, so in a sense, um, I mean, Plato would call it the, the, the pious fraud, you know, even though it's myth, meaning it's not real in the mathematical and, and the concrete sense. It's, it's a psychology of culture, which is necessary. So it, it really the question is, how do you handle it? You know, do you create a fiasco, as, as Campbell said, some heroes do? Um, or do you actually come up with something that's that's workable, that, that, that's useful, that that's um, as... Um, Aristotle said it helps culture to flourish, hmm. you know, so whether the myth is true or not is not even debatable because it, it's basically invented. It's a way we invent and impose ideas on reality hmm. and um, uh, on the afterlife and all that stuff. Uh, so I think Campbell's useful in that and, and sh you know, shouldn't be forgotten. But, you know, there, there are these warnings about, you know, carefully that don't create Campbell as a hero with the elixir that's giving you the idea that that you know following your bliss is going to solve your life i mean that's not what he was about and i i think there are limitations to, to his thought um i you know one of the great ideas in creative mythology the last volume of the mass of god he basically goes through a, a fairly simple arc that religion begins with a, and I am one of the people who objects to the use of the word shaman, um, which Aliada, I think, gives us, yeah. um, because it does refer to a specific group in uh, Siberia. But we don't have a better word. So the origins of religion seem to come in direct experience, where um, often as not, I mean, uh, Campbell uses the example of black elk among the Lakota yeah. people, and Black Elk Speaks is, is remarkable work. One wonders to what extent the poet who transcribed it for him may have added to it, but that's another point. But he as a child falls ill, hallucinates, has a vision, he's ill for a while, 
and he sees yeah. the hoop of his nation being broken. And this is before um, he's ever seen a white man. You know, they're living, well, they're not living peacefully, but they're living on the plains. You know, they're warriors and hunters. They don't live peacefully. Um, but they live in a harmonious society. And he saw the hoop of his nation completely broken. So they have some vision. They come away from that and you're among the Plains Indians and in many other places, we find that this child who's had the vision is now elevated and you know, mm -hmm. they are, will become a medicine man. They will become um, very often the artist, the healer, the teacher, the spiritual leader. And of course, uh, among the Plains Indians, they'll become the war chiefs that yeah. um, um, all of the famous, I mean, crazy horses or sitting one of them yeah yeah they all had this shamanic vision as children they were medicine men and they were people of wisdom there's um in vestonichi in uh czechos what was czechoslovakia i don't know which bit it's in now whether it's czech yeah. or slovak but i think campbell points to it that they found um an encampment twenty five thousand years old and there was one hut set apart and in this hut, they found, you know, a little bear, a little deer, a little mm. horse. And when they analyzed them, they found that the fat of each of these animals was a constituent part of how it had been put into the clay to make them. So there's this magical association. So this is your, your shaman. This is your shaman um, who, who has this. What Campbell says is then you get the, the priesthood and the priesthood rather than having an experience and meeting the gods or what have you, has a book. And they may well have, you know, through fasting and praying, they, they may have out-of-body hallucinations, but they're largely conveying a teaching from a book and mm -hmm. enforcing it on people, which, of course, in Christendom and in Islam as well, um, has at times led to catastrophe. Among people. You know, this is interesting. You bring up Black Elk, and of course, the most famous book about him is Black Elk Speaks. Mm -hmm. And 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 um, Campbell uh, references him, like you said. Mm -hmm. However, there's something about Black Elk that most people ignore that are seekers. He actually was a Catholic convert, and he did go to church. He did, you know, he wasn't immune to uh, seeing something real to him and mythically valuable in the Christian tradition. Um, there's a book about that that I have. It was written by a priest that knew him well. Yeah. So, uh, you know, that's another side of this story which people don't like to hear. They, they want to damn Christianity, raise up the shaman. But, you know, shamans do what they do, whether they're in a traditional culture or not. And if they, if something in Judaism or Buddhism or Christianity appeals to them, hell, they'll go for it, you know? So, yeah, um, and I think that's a really important point that, um, within that tradition, they're not saying, you know, we have become all knowing, we have become enlightened, mm -hmm. you know, and that it may well be that um, they find something else that is a better fit. Um, but, I don't know if it's better, but, but maybe it, it helps complete for them. them more. Yeah. 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 I don't know if it's better or not. It just helps them complete them. And they find no problem integrating the two. For example, I, I've um, in New Mexico when I lived there, I would attend festivals at the uh, um, uh, one of the uh, Pueblo Indian mm -hmm. ceremonies during the Easter time, and they would do their dances in all the traditional ways, wonderful costumes and drumming, and it would go for hours. And after that was over, they would all march silently into church and go to a Catholic mass. Not a problem, right? Yeah, and. <laughs> I think it is, you know, our beliefs are the metaphor that that works best for us. Yeah. Um, so, it, you know, and I mean, I I sort of stand back from um, atheism, from any belief system, basically. I, you know, I'm an agnostic. I don't know the first cause. I don't know how it happened, going with Thomas Huxley's original definition of the word. And it means that I don't get upset with people because of 
the way they frame the world and what they believe. Campbell went to a, a third stage in, in his belief, which was that creativity, uh, artistic ability, which is a transformative experience, is superior to the religions of the past that we're being given. He uses some, I think, terrible examples in terms of human beings, uh, Thomas Mann, uh, James Joyce, and Picasso, who were non, they were all of them deeply flawed human beings. But he says, they create the new myth that so, and by saying that the, admitting right out, it's a fiction, it's a novel, it's a story or it's a painting in, in Picasso's case, we, we look, you know, our transcendence becomes our own creativity, our own interpretation of art. And, and he's sort of saying there's, there's something important in there. I agree with him. As I say, I'm not sure that, you know, as moral examples, any one of those three human beings is to be followed. Um, but in fact, I'm sure they're not, quite frankly, having seen what Thomas Mann's kids said about him, what James Joyce's private letters reveal, and Picasso's boast that he paid nothing towards the upkeep of any of his, I believe, seven children, uh, even though he left, what was it, $123 million when he died in the early 70s, which had made him a billionaire now. Um, what a mean person. But he did paint Guernica, which is astonishing. Uh, I saw it last year. Remarkable. But that idea of our creativity, of our own ability, uh, I'm fascinated by a central Mexican people called the Huichol, and they are famous for being mescaline people. And they basically disappeared when the conquistador came along. And I think they moved 300 miles from their original home. And they set up a fascinating culture. Three anthropologists studied them, one around about 1900, another in the 30s, another went back in the 70s and said, how come these stories you told these two anthropologists are completely in contradiction with each other. And they said, so some stranger comes to you and asks for your secrets. What are you going to do? But they do have this one element. Um, this is, uh, this here is a wee chop piece. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I was really taken by these people. Yeah, uh, I've, uh, I've met wee chols that came to Santa Fe hmm. to sell you know they're 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 artifacts and and uh at a market there so you know i know the artwork it's, it's quite interesting yeah, yeah it's fascinating Colorful. fascinating yeah. stuff and that they every year they traipse off back to where they hail from it's a great long journey to get their peyotil so that they can have their masculine experience what fascinated me about them is that one of the other reasons why the anthropologists are not going to get a straight story is that each of them is meant to invent the religion for themselves. So the same stories are passed down, but you then have these hallucinogenic experiences, and I'm certainly not advocating that people do that. Um, can be good for some people, can be bad for other people. Um, not something I do myself. Um, but by, by having these experiences, they have to become the creative source of their own life. That's the idea. I mean, of course, they are stricken by various diseases and they don't have um, certain beneficial aspects of Western culture. And, you know, the romanticization of native people around the world is, you know, the, I think the hippies, are, you know, pick up this thread and they have this idea of, you know, Native Americans caring for the earth. Well, you know, the... Buffalo hunting wasn't on mass, wasn't started by Europeans. It was certainly finished by them. But there were peoples, once they got the horse, which had escaped from the Spanish, they could corral buffaloes and drive them off a cliff. And there are stories uh, in the 1850s of uh, just the tongs being taken because that's the tastiest bit. And a thousand carcasses would be, you know, they didn't want the pelts anymore. They didn't need those things. So... This, you know, romantic idea of cultures all over the, the world. Well, we're people. We're people everywhere. And some yeah, we, I just, 
Yeah, I just finished the uh, book about the Battle of Tippecanoe, which was one of the last uh, great wars between uh, Native Americans and, and uh, Americans. And it was around the war, before the War of 1812, um, which kind of finished off the British control around the US. Uh, but, but in that story, there was an awful lot of infighting between native tribes and many of them aligned with the Americans thinking it might be a better way of life than their old way of life, which was struggle and constant intertribal warfare or, or jousting or whatever they went through. So Native Americans weren't of a, one mind, certainly. No, and, yeah. uh, you know, so it, Tecumseh was the last great chief that tried to unite the tribes to, to bring this myth of the Native way of life, you know, back to what it was, meaning hunting, gathering, and a little bit of farming. And a lot of Native Americans disputed that. They didn't like his egotistical approach. They didn't believe in his prophecies. Um, and they certainly uh, uh, were willing to maybe make some compromises and treaties. Now, of course, the European man, the American, uh, didn't do well keeping these treaties over time. Uh, but that's another story. But the long as the sky uh, is blue. <laughs> yeah. So, but, 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 you know, all I'm bringing up here is what you said, is that the Native Americans were a knot of one mind. They were not some noble savage that, that the white Western writers wrote about in the late 19th century, you know, to sell novels. Yeah. Uh, that, that whole thing is a myth and, uh, out of whole cloth. Mm. Yes, absolutely. And, and you have as, almost as much diversity as you do in Europe. I mean, uh, we, we have this, this strange thing in the US now. That, that my friend Yuval Law was pointing out to me that um, uh, white supremacists in the US uh, relate themselves to the Nazis. And he said, well, you know, if you're of Polish descent, then uh, I'm afraid not. <laughs> you know, you were one of the, you were the principal target, along with the Jews of, and the Romanists of, of the Nazis, that it's not just being European that will get you there. Um, you've either got to be Germanic Aryan or their cousins, the Japanese Aryans, which was one of the more confusing aspects of their doctrine. Or but, maybe the, some Italians. <laughs> yeah, you see, even there, the, there are problems, you know. And, yeah. um, but, but the, you know, the, a vast um, country like the United States, you, you see astonishing differences between the peoples. And I mean, the first Cherokee to be interviewed said, we, we live to fight war. And Engels in you know, backing up Marx in what he was saying and saying, you know, women should have rights, which is a very good idea. He mistakenly used the example of the Iroquois, the Northern Iroquois, the Southern Iroquois being the Cherokee, saying, look, they're matriarchies. You see how wonderful yeah. it is, the matriarchy? And you go, yeah, they fought war all the time. We have the expression burying the hatchet from the Northern tribes who decided to stop spending their whole lives killing each other, you know? Yeah. So, I think the other thing is there's also cultural change that while the Black Hills are sacred to the Lakota, I believe the Lakota have only been there for about 400 years. Because yeah, they, they were migratory people. They, they didn't, they weren't sedentary for the most part. Maybe in the Southwest, they were more sedentary like Aztec, Mayan. Yeah. They developed vast cultures and the Anasazi for a while in, in Southwest US were somewhat sedentary for a few centuries. But but they certainly don't go back thousands of years as, as no, sedentary people. I believe the Apache had actually moved down from Alaska somewhere around the yes. 16th century and brought yeah, there. You know, it, particularly. Even, even today, there, there is tension between Navajo and Apache peoples. <laughs> you know, they, they see They're themselves as very home. different people. Yeah. Yeah. You know, they don't, they don't <laughs> necessarily condone intermarriage, at least in the 80s when I knew Apaches and knew Navajos, they told me this, that they didn't condone their kids marrying intertribally like that. So, so you know, they're, they're human beings. And we get this idea of ethnic uh, narcissism in every culture, you know. So, I, by the way, I've got to go here in a few minutes, John. Is there any way we could wrap this up? <laughs> sure. Well, I, I, I think it, it, I think it, for me, it's been a very interesting discussion. The, the final point is the extent to which Campbell has influenced the world, which is mightily, and that, that his work is interesting and useful, but it, it isn't a, 
and that he didn't put it forward as a sacred scripture. It, you know, no. he made mistakes. Uh, I think that there's a fundamental idea. He said that um, we should um, basically make our religion out of our intimate relationships. And the thing that is really important to say about Joseph Campbell is he didn't have any children. Right. So he was able to have this little worship of the beautiful dancer that he married. Um, but that's not how the real world works. That, that um, I do believe that our intimate relationships are sacred, but I believe that he misses the point of the friendship network of the extended family and you know, his, his romanticizing of the chivalric era, the courts of love. He seems yeah. to miss that actually these uh, courtly lovers were paying their attentions to other men's wives for brief periods of time until they found somebody else they could, you know, so it's more a kind of Lancelot mm -hmm. and Guinevere than yeah. Guinevere. And, and we have to question how platonic the whole arrangement was also. Yeah. <laughs> so. But but yeah, fascinating discussion. As yes. I, and um, we'll, we'll switch. Thank off. you, John. I appreciate it. This was good. Maybe we could do it again at some point. I don't know how soon, but maybe the coming year. Well, <laughs> let's, um, when we finish talking to these people, let's uh, have a quick look at our diaries and see what we can put in. Okay. But this has been great. I'm John Atak. And, this and I'm Joe Simhart. Yep. Thank you very much. Thank you for your attention. Hi, John here. Thanks for watching. We'd appreciate it very much if you would click like as well as subscribe and click the bell for notifications. Every dollar helps and we welcome new patrons on Patreon. Or you can make a one-off payment with any currency through PayPal. Thanks so much.